Mr. Chairman, thank you very kindly um, for the time. Um, I, I confess the, uh, arriving late, um, which is perhaps the explanation, I'm a bit puzzled about what's going on here because um, the COVID-19 cost us um, nearly a million and a half people um, in the country. Um, it was calamitous to the public health and um, a terrible shock to the uh, economy and the society. Uh, President Biden's vaccine program, according to the Commonwealth Fund, saved 3 million lives and 18 million hospitalizations for serious effects from COVID-19. And so uh, I'm just surprised that the tenor of this hearing um, is to attack the, I think, the very selective cases in which there were vaccine mandates, for example, for public health workers, for people in the military and a handful of other uh, populations like that. I suppose the first question is, is it constitutional? Um, and I think my colleague from North Carolina dealt with that. I mean, if you just go to the, go to the website for your local school system and look and see what shots your kids have to get before you enroll them in kindergarten or seventh grade or third grade, I just looked at ours, um, tetanus, diphtheria, tetanus, uh, pertussis, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, polio. Um, is the claim, is anybody making the claim, I'm happy to yield for three or four seconds, is anybody making the claim that these are unconstitutional? Okay, because there, none of them have ever been struck down on constitutional grounds. So we're not talking about a violation of due process liberty or even what's left of it after the Supreme Court's decision striking down Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. I mean, that of course was, um, you know, a catastrophe for the idea of due process, privacy, and liberty interests against government mandates. Um, but I've not heard an argument that it's unconstitutional. Um, is it good for the public health? It's hard to see how it couldn't be good for the public health, for example, to have public health workers vaccinated um, or people in the armed forces who already have to get all of these other shots also to get another shot for COVID-19. So um, my, my last uh, colleague asked the question, well, did the COVID-19 mandates, and I, I'm surely the, um, the image of mandates went way beyond what the reality of the mandates were, given that they were geared to very specific subsets of the population. But I think a bigger question is, did all of the anti-COVID-19 propaganda undermine uh, people's faith in public health, in public health authorities? I mean, when Donald Trump urged uh, everybody to get hydroxychloroquine or uh, floated the idea of just injecting yourself with bleach or just said that magically COVID-19 was going to uh, disappear overnight or saying, don't worry, you know, the Chinese government is doing a great job. They're doing a magnificent job. And on 36 different occasions, uh, praising the work of the Chinese government, you can check it out online, sir. Um, and I'd be very happy to send you all of the, uh, the tweets and the statements that, that President Trump made praising President Xi and his magnificent work on COVID-19. I think that probably had a lot more to do with undermining people's confidence in public health. But Dr. Lynch, let me ask you, um, do people have a free exercise religious right not to follow a, a vaccine mandate, um, you know, as a public health worker in the military, for example, um, or any secular law that they think burdens their religious freedom? I'm not a legal scholar, but I can speak to the process, and that is that um, when I look at this in our own system and, and people would submit religious requests for accommodation, there was no question as to sincerely held religious beliefs, and I think that's a common approach. The question is really is, can I make you as safe as someone who is vaccinated? And the answer in healthcare settings, and I think in many other settings, is no. And I, I think it's an excellent way of thinking about it because the... Um, the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia in the lead, has consistently rejected the idea that you have a free exercise right to opt out of, for example, marijuana laws if you're Rastafarian, 
or uh, peyote laws if you're Native American Indian and part of that religion. Your religious free exercise rights don't give you the right to opt out of a generally applicable universal secular law that's not adopted for the purposes of religious coercion or intimidation. But we've made a voluntary accommodation for people saying, if you really don't want to do this in the school context in a number of states, then you don't have to do it. But of course, we see major outbreaks of diseases among the Amish, for example, or Orthodox Jews in New York and certain populations when they refuse to engage in certain vaccines. So I think that we're in the right place here, which is the va we, we invest in the vaccines, we get out real education against all of the propaganda as much as we can, and then we give people a voluntary right to opt out where we think we can afford to do that, and they benefit from everybody else's herd immunity, as we hope all of us will. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you kindly.